is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Dracula the terrifying, the feared, who sleeps in the tombs of the dead by day and arises at night to inflict his terror upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. Oh, you must help me. You must. You're my only hope. You must. I'll help you. I promise. Try and understand. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. How do you destroy a fiend who has so far proven himself indestructible? Those who come to end his reign of terror stay to become his victims. Castle Dracula is summoned here in Klausenburg. Will you tell me how I get there? You ordered a meal, sir. As an innkeeper, it's my duty to serve you. When you've eaten, I ask you to go and leave us in peace. This is the doctor who dares to challenge the vampire Dracula. This is the anguished man who fears for the lives of his beloved, the girl who is his sister, and the one that is his wife. Dracula, the bedeviled master of all that is evil. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be taking a look at the myth and legend of the vampire. That's right guys, so when I think of the vampire I think of uh, Christopher Lee in the Hammer House of Horror because that's the generation that I was brought up with. Um, so that's the first image that I have in my head. So it's kind of popularised um, by Hammer Horror or Hollywood movies books um and all through my life you know when you when you say vampire i know what you're talking about and throughout the world it turns out that most people do as well because i've had a look into this subject and vampires in terms of myths myths and legends is generally that thing that most people can associate with um and looking at it it's you've got um (laughs) Myths and legends, like I say, all around the world, internationally, you've got China, they had um, the Shang Li, Australia, they had the Yarin Yahoo, India, the Azro Pa, Brazil, the Jerry Char Char, I'm, I'm not making these names up, people, uh, Europe, you had the Strix, the String A, the Revenant, the Vampire, the Draco, and... Um, Most of these stories as well, they they do predate the Bible, they go right back to the year dot, even the um, story of Adam and Eve. Uh, There's a story of Lilith, who was Adam's first husband, and she got banished from the Garden of Eden. It's uh, it's actually an incredible story, I won't go too much into detail of that, but um, she basically turned up as a demon throughout folklore and she was taking like children during the night times and stuff like that and then when I mentioned like folklore and stories and these stories going right back to like say the year dot the um, Sumerians the Mesopotamians uh, the Greeks um, they all believed in some creature that would turn up and like take take the source of energy from your body like blood and uh, have have immortality, um, and that has continued right up until today. So there are there are ways of telling these stories. The the like I say, you've got the folklore stories, um, old tales, books, and now today you've got like I say, you've got Hollywood, you know, interpretations in movies. And I do love that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a film 
fan myself, as I mentioned with my other podcast, Bite Size Cinema, where I talk about films. Um, but my first interpretation of it is, as I mentioned in the start of this show, was, um, you know, the Christopher Lee vampire. You know, he's got fangs, he's got cloak. Um, and then he has his, his rival, which is Van Helsing. So, again, in these stories, you have the fight between good and evil. Um, but even though these um, vampires are creatures of the night, and the more I've looked into this subject, and it's something I've probably looked at, you know, throughout like movie history and that is that vampires are like a sort of temptations of of humans because when you look at them they they have immortality and i think one of my favorite movies because i think films is a good way to you know explain this as well um let's just take the film the lost boys which is one of my favorite films and it says on the poster it says you know sleep all day party all night it's fun to be a vampire and the vampires in that film are kind of cool. You know, they're the cool kids at school. They ride motorbikes. They've got their sort of cool cave. They go out at night. They spend most of the time at the um, fun fair. Uh, they're doing all sorts of cool stuff. And they almost, and I've said this before, they come across as sort of like, kind of like anti-heroes. But there's a part of the movie where um, they say to the main protagonist, you know, you can do all this cool stuff, but you have to feed. And this is the flaw of the vampire. You have to kill somebody or, you know, suck someone's blood in order to keep this going on. And then that's kind of like the thing that makes them terrifying is that they will come to you at night time and try and feed on your energy. But this is also an interesting point as that is my interpretation of a vampire in modern times because that is how it's been portrayed to me. And... That hasn't always been the case in old folklore because in going right back to the Sumerian times and the Greek times and even the times of like uh, medieval, um, particularly in Europe, they weren't always seen like that. They, they, they were creatures that were going to come out and basically kill you and people were terrified of this. Um, it wasn't until, and this is probably worth mentioning now, um, as we all know, Bram, Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, one of the most famous novels in the world. It hasn't been out of print all the time that it's, it's been published. And let's talk about that now. So Dracula, the novel, came out in 1897. It was written by the Irish novelist Bram Stoker. And he really did just base... This was like the building block of the modern day vampire. And he actually spent seven years uh, researching European folklore and the stories of vampires. And he was talking about a particular vampire or a creature from Europe in the 17th century called the Strigoi. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, guys. But the Strigoi was a troubled spirit that would rise from the grave. So it's pretty, pretty much a zombie. Um, but in order for it to survive after coming out from the grave, it needed to feed on blood. And it would also turn into an animal. So that's where you get the thing as well with the vampires turn into an animal or a vampire or a bat. And the only way that the villagers could deal with this Strigoi is to put it back into its grave and then nail it back down to the ground with um, eight inch iron nails. So you could say this is all sort of made up and things like that, but there has been some cases where archaeologists today have actually found graves with skeletons in them, with nails being impaled into the skeletons. And it just sort of makes you wonder, you know, what were they doing back in those times? And then you've got this story of the Strigoi in the European folklore, which Bram Stoker took a look at, and then he, he built everything else with the, as I mentioned, the story of Lilith, the Mesopotamians, um, the Greeks. And he took all those ingredients, and then, he, and then there was born the, the story of Dracula. So he's taken the... Um, folklore towels and then he's put in another ingredient which is um, as we all know um, with vampires is the story of the Romanian ruler Vlad the Impala uh, who they called the Dracoi and the Dracoi means devil or the dragon and he was the like I say the 15th century uh, ruler that used to spike people as well so then there you go you got the spike you got Vlad 
you've got the Dracu, you've got Dracula, uh, you've got the Tr uh, Strigoi story where he needs to be empowered as well, he's, he's risen from the grave. Um, so you've got all these ingredients and then Bram Stoker's put it into the book. And then the other ingredients that he's put in there, he's, he's kind of made the vampire kind of, I suppose you want to, you know, sort of sexy in some sort of ways or very sort of charming. And I guess that's going to be his way to lure in the victims in order for him to continue. Um, so it's, the, the book's kind of got that charm, it's got that intrigue, like I say, it's, it's never been out of, of print. And like I say, to to today, um, we now have that that interpretation of the vampire. But before Stoker's book, the vampire was pretty much a zombie uh, without all the charm and that that was going to come out and kill you from the you know the European folklore. And the other thing to mention here when I'm talking about books is that I didn't realise this. There was actually a book that came out before Stoker's Dracula called Vampire. And that came out in the early 19th century, around about 1820. And it was uh, John Polidori. Um, so he actually brought out a book, um, a story of the vampire. So again, uh, Stoker took that as well. And then just, you know, like I say, flowered it up a little bit. Um, and then, of course, you had um, the Anne Rice books that came out in the 70s, the interview with the vampire. Um, not to forget about that one as well. So you've got these interpretations of the vampires. But what I'm going to move on to now is um, some information that I got from my, my good friend, Nick Isaacs. A uh, little shout out to him. He's, he's, he's like the sort of uh, vampire hunter from the movies. You know, I, I, it's... <laughs> You can imagine him in a tweeded jacket and I'll go to him, Nick, I've got a vampire problem, can you help me? And he just pull out all these old dusty books and things like that and uh, try and help me out. So just try and get that image in your head with my friend Nick. So a little shout out to you there. But he's come up with some interesting stuff. He's helped me out with my research here. And um, something which is important to try and get your head around the vampires and... It's actually uh, putting vampires into like a type of system. So you've got four different types of vampires. Um, the first one is the immortal vampire. So that is interpreted as uh, the Dracula character. You know, he lives in his he lives in his mansion, and then he lures people in to then feed on their their blood source for immortality. So that's the vision of that that vampire, the immortal one. You've then got the mortal vampire, which is like uh, the cannibals, um, in a way to describe it. So you've got people, let's just use uh, Dr. Hannibal Lecter um, from Light Silence of the Land. So he's not going, to, he's going to eat human flesh, but he's not going, but he, he will still die. He won't live forever. So that's the, the, the mortal vampire, but he's still taken in like, um, like blood. Um, from the the vampire interpretation, but that is doing nothing for him to you know uh, create immortality. So this is the example of that. But it, it can still be seen as a vampire in that sense. You've then got uh, you've then got the uh, intentional psychic vampire, which is I, I find this very interesting, and it's basically um, someone who will drain your energy, um, and it's. Probably the one that, when it, I always chuck this in the episode, I always say, is there a plausible thing with these stories? Is there, is, there some real, is there something real about it? I believe there is with this one here, the Intentional Psychic Vampire, which is the one where if you ever, if you ever come across someone, you spend a bit of time with them and you come away and you think, I feel absolutely emotionally drained today. That person has drained all my energy. And I guarantee there's some of you listening to this episode going, yeah, yeah, I get that. There you go. Next time you spend time with that person, think about it. There might be a vampire. There you go. Then on the flip side to that, you have the unintentional vampire who actually makes you feel good. And they're actually giving you energy. So again, it's that um, thing of you spend a bit of time with someone. You think, God, that person makes me feel really good. I feel really energized. And it's almost like that sort of, you know, 
it can even be that old, you know, we all say it, oh, God, I met someone today and I feel like I've known them for years and I'll get on really well with them, so do you know what I mean? And those two last cases is what kind of makes the vampire thing, it puts it into a, a plausible realm, so shall we say. So there you go, there's the four types of vampires. Um, so really, the only one that is really, I mean, you know, I've, you know, in the strange world, you know, we do have cannibals. You know, we do have those those cases of people wanting to eat each other. Um, so the only one that really is, um, you know, taken from sort of myths, legends and fiction and all that sort of stuff is the immortal Dracula. But again, I always say, you know, who knows? Could there be a Dracula out there? I don't know. Let's blame the aliens. I haven't spoken about the aliens yet. They always have something to do with this. They say, vampire aliens. Yeah, that'd probably be a good movie. I'm sure someone's already turned that into a film. So, yeah, so you've got those four different types, which is great. So, But also, the other thing that Nick has mentioned to me as well, is he's told me this fantastic um, story. One of his holidays or a place that he likes to go to is Santorini in Greece. Now, Santorini is a possible rest, uh, possible location for the city of Atlantis, which I'll we'll get into in a second. But this island is apparently infested with vampires, and there is old, again, old folklore stories that people believe that there are vampires on this island, the real bloodsuckers. And again, these stories go back to around about the same time as the Strigoi in Europe, uh, 17th century. Soldiers used to come to the island and they used to fear going there because they thought that they were going to get attacked by these um, vampires, which we now call today. Now, there is a little bit of plausibility in this, is, is in that uh, Santorini used to be a volcano and it erupted all those years ago. It's even caused like a sort of round shape. On, on the island in, in its ge geographic nature but with the molten ash it's actually turned the soil into like a type of antiseptic so when you bury a body in the island it doesn't actually decompose properly so people were burying these bodies and then it's turned out that they you know the bodies weren't uh, decomposing properly so whether that was that's added something to the myth I it, it, Possibly, that's, that's, that's a, like a plausible explanation for it, but there was these old folklore tales from Santorini, there's a whole load on it, um, go go check it out. Now I mentioned Atlantis as well, I, and I caught this online as well for a bit of research, um, and I'm going to throw it in because Atlantis, I haven't mentioned it yet on the show, it's something I probably will talk about as an episode, but what they're saying, someone was saying that um, Atlantis got infested by vampires the old ancient civilization and the reason why um, Atlantis disappeared or it just or it, as some people say it self-destructed and went to the bottom of the ocean is that because you had the running water is the only way that you get rid of a vampire is that um, Atlantis kind of like took one for the team it self-destructed because it was overridden by vampires and it went to the bottom of the ocean and this person's theory was that it was to this day it was holding back the vampires from the rest of the world so there you go i like that it's it's a little bit it's a little bit hollywood but i thought i'd throw that one in because i haven't spoken about atlantis yet and earlier i mentioned that this story um predated the bible so talking about the bible there's another story that i like you basically got the story of um jesus and the cross because um Again, in the Hollywood stories that to, to stop a vampire you need to use a cross, um, there's some silver, there's a stake to the heart. And when you think about it, you think about the story of Christ in the Bible, you've got Judas who betrayed Jesus and you know some people say that he's actually Judas who turned into the vampire. I think they got portrayed in the 90s version of Bram Stoker's um, Dracula saying that's where Vlad came from. And when you think about it, it kind of it ties all the ways that you can repel a vampire. So you've got the cross. So it's like uh, God's way of banishing Judas, saying that I'm going to give you immortality. But every time you see a cross, that's going to remind you of this event. It's the uh, silver that he was paid to betray him. Obviously the sunlight, so that's the next day of the sun rising. And the stake to the heart, I think it was the... 
was it one of the Roman soldiers who states um, Jesus, you know, to put him out of his of, of his misery? So you've got all those things that kind of tie it up, which you know, which is which I find interesting, you know, in in this story. So that kind of ties it all in. And then going back to some archaeological evidence, um, archaeologists have found graves going right back to uh, 4,500 BC. Uh, graves particularly found in Cyprus of bodies pinned down by milestones. And more recently, in the 1990s, um, they found a 19th century coffin with a body staked to the ground with uh, several 8-inch uh, long iron spikes, as I mentioned earlier. So there is some weird stuff out there when you think about it and when, and the other thing is um the other thing to think about when you think of vampires and modern times is actually what's around you as well um in terms of uh yeah you've got like mosquitoes and leeches and ticks so actually in the world around us there are things out there that do you know every year or you go on holiday you get mosquitoes they turn up they land on you, and effectively they are sucking the blood out of your body, so they're like little vampires themselves. And leeches that suck the blood out of you, ticks, you know, on our pets, they suck the blood out of you. So the plausibility of a vampire is out in the world around us when you look at it. Now going back to Hollywood and cinema, I need to mention this one because... Uh, the first uh, German silent movie called Nosferatu. So when I'm talking about modern times, when we think about vampires, this 1922 silent movie comes to mind. You know, Nosferatu, um, very menacing. He's that typical modern-day vampire with the fangs, and he's got long fingernails, and he creeps around, and he visits you at night. Um, and he was called uh, Count Orlock in the movie. Um, and it was an unofficial adaptation of Stoker's Dracula, but I think this was the building block for the movies that we've got today. But there's a little bit of in interesting trivia about this film where you've got the actor called Mac Schleck. And again, a little shout out to uh, my friend Nick, because um, you know he's one of the biggest like vampire fans that I know. And he told me this story about him actually... Uh, you know, people actually believe that he was a vampire himself they, they, because he was a loner um, he spent a lot of time to himself um, he was known back in those times for like playing uh, grotesque um, characters but not you know he turned up and said he did what he had to do and then he just kind of vanished and a lot of people said he just liked spending time walking throughout the forest by himself and some people even believed that he may have been a vampire. So I thought well, that would be worth mentioning. It's also an incredibly creepy 1922 silent movie, which is worth um, uh, checking out. It was also redone in the year 2000 as an uh, indie horror movie, The Shadow of the Vampire, played by William Dafoe. So there you go, guys. That is vampires. They've been around an awful lot, an awful long time. The same time as we have on on the planet um, in mythology and folklore. And I believe they will continue alongside us until we we last out on the planet as well. And um, as I said, you know, food for thought. When you look around, you can sort of see after having a look at the uh, myths and legends and all that. There is, as I always, say. Um, with my previous episodes, I like to bring in the plausibility to it all, and there is a little bit of plausibility um, in this in this story when you think about it. You know, um, because as humans, we need we need to feed. You know, now whether that's your you know vegetarian, vegan, or you, you know you like a nice steak, um, uh, you sometimes need an energy drink or you know a cup of tea, whatever you know, whatever gives you that energy, that basically brings it into the, the basic platform, so of a vampire, uh, which kind of makes sense to me then, but then I suppose a vampire is the opposite of a human being, whereas we generally, as humans, go to bed at night, we sleep throughout the night, and as soon as the sun rises, we get up, the vampire is kind of like, you know, he has to 
go to bed during the day when we get up, you know, into his coffin and he thrives on, on the darkness and all that sort of stuff. And um, he is that sort of monster in the shadows, which we will always fear. And like I say, that's why I've mentioned the folklore throughout throughout the years. We're, we're always going to think about those legends. And I suppose it is kind of like the sort of the yin yang, the positive, negative and all that sort of stuff. So in modern times, uh, I guess we're always going to have that um, curiosity of the vampire. And then obviously with in... And this is quite an interesting topic when you think about it. You had folklore towels back in so like the ancient times, medieval times, campfire towels. And then, like I say, in the, the, the Bram Stoker times, people were reading books and it was firing up their imagination to now the, we have movies and some incredibly good ones as well, some really good you know, I, I'm a horror fan myself. I think there's some great vampire films out there. You know, as I mentioned, The Lost Boys, Fright Night. And then you've got films like Blade, where you've kind of got a vampire type anti hero. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, they are generally a, is an interesting topic, you know. And generally, when you're out and about, even if you're on holiday or whatever, and you're reading a book by the pool and you, you know, Someone from another country might say, oh, yeah, you know, vampires, I know about those. So, um, yeah, on the whole, it is an interesting topic. Really good one. Um, very fascinated by it. Um, I will be, I'm going to be coming back to something like this again, but we we're probably talking about werewolves um, some point in the show, which is another part of that family, I think, you know, because I think there is a sort of werewolf connection there as well, especially with the silver bullets and the moon and all that sort of stuff, so similar type of thing. So um, there you go, guys, we're going to wrap it up on that. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, hope that kind of makes sense to you with the, with the legends and the myths. And also, um, shout out to my friend Nick, so thanks for helping me with the, um, the, the research and the information there. So um, there you go, guys. Um, bit of admin for the show i am a proud member of the legion podcast network so please go and check out all the other shows on there including my other show bite Size cinema podcast where i do movie reviews um you can find um mystery vault podcast on itunes spotify youtube and several other players um on the internet if you put in uh the mystery vault podcast onto google also check out my facebook page that's where i'm most active and if you want to leave a, a review or something like that on itunes it'd be much appreciated it kind of just bumps in me up the ladder a little bit on there um and what am i doing next i'll be doing uh the fairies next uh, there was that i can't remember i should i should remember this it was the one with the little girl at the bottom of the garden with the photograph it's um an episode that my uh, good buddy Dan Bone has uh, requested, and uh, I'll tell you now, apparently it's a hoax, this this photograph, but what I'm going to be talking about in this episode is, um, you know, fairies generally themselves, the fae in folklore, and um, also hoaxes, when people say it's hoax, is it really a hoax or is it a cover-up? And there you go, it's food for thought. So I'll be taking a look at that episode, so look out for that. So there you go, guys, um, and remember... Be armed with your cross and your garlic and all that sort of stuff and your holy water and uh, look out for those vampires. So I'll see you soon. Keep it spooky, keep it safe. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. Because one of you, sitting here in this room, is a whale. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, 
Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.